Hey, LinkedIn, and welcome back to Business Unusual. This is a live show brought to you by the LinkedIn News Team, where we're talking as a community about the changing nature of work. I'm Caroline Fairchild, editor-at-large here at LinkedIn, coming to you from my home office here in New York City. It's Tuesday, July 28th, and here's a look at the top trending stories on LinkedIn right now. Major companies are starting to put their flag in the ground and declaring that things will not go back to business as usual for quite some time. Google will allow employees to work from home until at least July 2021 in light of the pandemic. The decision impacts some 200,000 employees and contract workers globally. CEO Sudar Pinchai said in an interview that his decision was based in part by uncertainty around school reopenings and how that will impact parents. And retailers from traditional places are saying that Black Friday sales are simply not an option during the global pandemic. Target, Walmart, and Dick's Sporting Goods have all announced that they are shutting down a decade-long tradition of kicking off holiday sales in stores on Thanksgiving. COVID-19 cases continue to rise around the country, prompting several leaders of major U.S. cities, including the mayor of Los Angeles, to say testing delays in overwhelmed hospitals may make stay-at-home orders necessary again. Total coronavirus cases in Florida have now surpassed New York's total. For more stories like these, be sure to check out the news module to the right of your LinkedIn feed, which brings us to the poll that we have for you in the stream today. Do you think that another shutdown is possible for your state? A, yes, B, no, C, depends. Vote in the stream right now, but also explain, where are you right now? What's going on on the ground? We'd love to hear from you. And at the end of the show, we'll re reveal the results of the poll and have a conversation about that, which brings us to today's main story. It's a challenging time for everyone right now, particularly for job seekers who are asking to have to do career pivots in real time. On today's show, we'll bring on a leader who has faced uncertainty, tackled adversity, and has taken risks throughout the entirety of her career. Lieutenant General Nadia West is Nadia West is with us here on the show. She's the first black female Army Lieutenant General and the highest ranking woman to graduate from the US Military Academy. She'll join us to share her experience moving up the ranks in the military, as well as what she has seen on the ground now as a physician advising healthcare companies through the crisis. Before we bring on Nadia West, I wanna hear from you. What's going on on the ground with you? How are things at work? The whole point of the show is to have a conversation as, as a community about the changing nature of work during the coronavirus pandemic. So let us know in the comments how you're doing. And with that, I wanna bring on Dr. West to the show. Hi, Hi Nadia. Hey, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thank you so much for joining us on Business Unusual. No, it's a pleasure to be with you here today. So I want to start with you and your career. There are a few lines in your resume that don't start with the first to do something pretty amazing. We have so many people on the stream right now who are dealing with the first right now. They're having to work through this pandemic and facing so many challenges. Where did you find your drive and your ability to achieve things that you know before had never been accomplished? Well, Carolyn, it started at home. Um, having a great example with my parents, my dad, who was a trailblazer in his own right, he joined the Army when it was segregated in 1939 and kind of went through a lot of uh, concerns and, and challenges and just could imagine growing up during that time. And he really ascended the ranks uh, in the Army State for 33 years uh, as an example of persistence and commitment. And also he saw the promise of the military. And so that was what I grew up in, someone who, who uh, worked hard and, uh, and gave us those values. And the same with my mom, who was you know, quite a pistol herself, as they'd say. She grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas, uh, was a, you know, did time in journalism, was on the Afro-American newspaper, a bit of an activist of her own right in the, in the time that she grew up. So that's kind of what gave me my start, is an example at home of uh, anything that's, uh, that you can dream, you can do if you work hard and, and persevere. Mm -hmm. And you were adopted as a child and grew up in a very big household. I think you had 11 siblings running around. How do you think that that changed your, in the way that you think about work and the way that you went about your career? Absolutely, and I, I tell you, what a, uh, what a blessing for me, because again, just as you, as you mentioned, uh, my resume would have uh, been empty if I hadn't been uh, adopted by such a wonderful, loving family. Uh, they changed me from being an orphan with an uncertain future to someone who had the opportunities and the abilities to do the things that I've done as well as my older brothers and sisters. And, uh, and being the youngest, I was able to watch them as well. A lot of them were uh, in uh, the military as well. And so they, they all, I can only imagine my mom trying to do this and my mom and dad both, uh, you know, 12 kids, although we weren't all necessarily there at the same time, uh, it's a challenge. It's a challenge to, you know, transportation was a challenge and just making sure that we all had 
everything we needed on a you know meager salary that my parents had. I mean, they were you know they were not wealthy. They were uh, you know so they were t t making ends meet the best that they could. So I, I feel for people who have you know kids. I have you know two of my own. They're both out of the house now, and it was really a struggle trying to make sure that we had uh, you know the had them covered between my husband and I, who was also in the army, a career soldier. Uh, that we had the kids covered when we were growing up. And so we were thankful for what the, uh, the programs that the military had to ensure that we had someone to watch our children uh, when we couldn't or if we were deployed. So I can only imagine those who are now going through what, what kind of uh, programs are there, what am I going to do uh, if I have to go back to work and schools aren't open. So I could definitely feel for, for individuals in that uh, situation. Let's talk about that a little bit because we are seeing so many members on LinkedIn who are parents who are struggling right now with this idea of return to work. I know that as a physician, you're advising several healthcare companies right now on what companies should be doing, how they should be thinking about their business. As a parent, but also as a physician, where, where are you right now on this issue? What should parents be thinking about right now and any tips that you have in terms of juggling at all, particularly during a global pandemic? Yeah, so from the from the physician and the parent standpoint, safety first, right? Safety first is important. Health, the health and well-being of your family uh, and yourself and society, that, that comes first. And so making sure that we're doing everything we can according to what our, uh, our public health professionals and official uh, statements that they make. The, the CDC, of course, is putting out official recommendations on how to best protect yourselves. Uh, and all of ourselves and our neighbors uh, from you know, contracting COVID. And it's really basic. It's, you know, the wearing a mask, uh, managing your secretions, your sneezes and coughs, you know, responsibly so it's not out into the environment, washing your hands frequently, not touching your face and making sure if you wear a mask that you don't touch the front of the mask because then you're exposing yourself. Um, and then social distancing, all those things that um, it sounds really basic and you know, archaic in this day and age, but it's extremely helpful and valuable. So safety first and uh, of your family and making sure that they're abiding by all those public health recommendations. Mm -hmm. Second thing I would think about, of course, is you're wondering, so what about school education is important. So, if, you know, what are you, what can you do at home to make sure that your, um, your kids are, are getting the education they need? And of, of course, staying abreast of what's happening in your school districts making sure you understand and have a voice if there is a special equipment that's needed uh, that you don't have access to, um, ensuring that you understand what it is you know, that, uh, that's needed for the, for the children to maintain their, um, their education. And it's the same thing with, with work. Make sure that you're vocal with your, um, with your organizations that you work for. Hey, this is a concern for us. I'm sure they're tracking it, but unless you let them know and put a, put a face to that concern, you know, that will also help them uh, make adjustments, hopefully, and, and help assist with, uh, with the families with children that are their valued employees. And for those of you who are just joining the stream, this is Business Unusual, a live show where we're talking about the changing nature of work. I'm here with retired Lieutenant General Nadia West, and we're having a conversation about navigating the crisis, as well as her experience right now on the ground as a physician advising healthcare companies through the crisis. I want to say hello to some members who are joining us on this stream, Dr. West, Judy from California, Terry from Georgia, Charlie from Alabama, Clara from Indiana, Deborah from Florida, all different states. Make sure that you vote in our poll of the day. We want to know what's going on on the ground and if you think that another shutdown is possible. Nancy says, many uncertainties right now with school openings. I'm a school administrator and hoping to work remotely. Nancy, thanks for joining us on the show and for your insights. Dr. West, you were a part of the third class at West Point that accepted women. Take me back to that beginning part of your education and your career in the military. Did you think that when you graduated, you would go on to become the highest ranking woman in the military? Or take me back to that initial time. Well, to answer your first question, did I think that I would be the, heck, the highest ranking woman? Absolutely not. Um, I was just happy to graduate. You know, I never had any aspirations um, of being a general officer. I mean, not that I would have, you know, not wanted to do it. I actually, I'm very honored and blessed to be able to do it. But I never would have thought that that was even anywhere within my reach because, you know, at the time looking ahead, even as, you know, majors and colonels, I thought those were like the, the coolest people on earth. And to be a general officer, um, remember, I went to a school where we had statues of MacArthur, right? Uh, we just had a new statue of, of Grant that was there, uh, Pershing, all of these, uh, Patton, there was a huge a huge, uh, you know, um, statue of Patton in front of the library. So 
I went to a school where all of these, uh, you know, the general officers were these phenomenal individuals in, uh, you know, in our history. And so I never thought or saw myself as being able to, to do that. I was, again, honored to go to the, to the, to, to the school. I was, you know, again, my parents were in the, I, my dad was in the military, my brothers and sisters, so I wanted to serve. I, but I never had any idea that it would be at this level. Um, so that's, uh, so that, that was definitely not a, not something that I thought that was in my, even within my purview to be able to, to dream about. I wanted to ask you that question because I just feel like across industries right now, there are so many people who feel stuck, who feel like the next place that they thought that they were going to get in their career, or the next job or promotion is just so unattainable right now. What would you say to them in terms of where you were at the beginning of your career and where you are now and some challenges that you had to face and how you kind of face them head on? Yeah, and I would tell the I would tell the individuals that think that is don't take yourself out of the race before you even start running, and that was my problem. I I, I ran track, um, actually ran eighty yard hurdles. For for those of you that don't know what yards are, now that everything's metered, that shows how old I am. But you know, I ran track, so you know if you don't even put yourself in the position to participate in a race, you're never going to win. I mean, that's that's a hundred percent guarantee. You will not win. You will not place anywhere. You have to start the race. And I think so many people take themselves out of it. And I did it myself. I talked myself out of things. Oh, that's too hard. Or, oh, I can't do that. So that's the first thing I would say. The second thing I would say, if you're afraid, um, sometimes you have to work afraid. Just do it with fear and um, make sure that you just, just almost like fake it. Okay, if you're not confident, if you're scared, then just do it. I mean, there were things I did uh, at West Point the first time I had to assemble and disassemble an M16 uh, uh, rifle. I'd never touched a weapon before in my life. And I was the only woman in my squad. I was just turning 17 years old. So can you imagine? And a lot of the guys, some of them were prior service and they were assembling those things like, you know, it was nothing. And I was thinking, wow, how am I ever gonna do this? And so, but I did, you know, and everybody was kind of, you know, hoo hoo and growling. And so I looked left and right and I started growling too. And so, you know, I just, you know, tried to, try to you know psych myself into saying okay you can do this so that's how to tell people don't take yourself out of the race before you start running and if you're afraid sometimes you just have to say okay I'm afraid but I'm going to keep going and uh, and the other thing I would say is you know uh, the worst in in most cases the worst that can happen if you ask a question or you go for something is someone can say no and, and that was advice that I got when I was going to talk myself out of applying to medical school out of West Point, I said, well, you know, it's too hard. You know, I'm not that, you know, I, I can't do it. It's tough. And, and it's, and, and so one of my mentors said, okay, look, you're a cadet at West Point. You can clearly take the challenge. And what's, what do you have to lose? You can apply and the worst that they can do is say no. And the only thing you're out of is the time it took to fill out the application and the application fee. And if the fee is too much, I'm sure you could get it waived if there's any you know, financial issues. So you really have nothing to lose but the time it takes to fill out the application. And of course you have to do the MCATs and, and have all the prerequisites. But if you're prepared, what's the worst they can say? No. And uh, I think that's, uh, but, but he said, but the answer will 100% be no if you don't even ask the question. And that's kind of like you know taking yourself out of the race before you start. Uh, so those are some of the things I would say to people that are reticent, go for it. And just when I thought Dr. West couldn't be more impressive, she's telling me that she can run 80-yard sprints at one point, and she's also growling in a room with army men assembling weapons. So thank you, Dr. West, for that. I just, I, those are things that are not on your LinkedIn profile that we love to hear on Business Unusual. I want to say hello to some more members on the stream right now. Windsor says, a phenomenal human being. Thank you, Dr. West, for marrying compassion, commitment, and courage. Will says, thank you for your time and service to our country. So I want to say hi to Windsor and Will. Thank you for joining us on the show. That's such a great point, not taking yourself out of the race before you even start running. And I know that that's something that a lot of people are feeling like they were left out of the race because they're home right now working and just alone. Another topic that we hear a lot on LinkedIn is how do you build trust remotely? We have these screens between us now. We have to work with, you know, not seeing people in person. A lot of your career in the Army, you were responsible for people's lives and building trust was essential. As you think about workers who are now in the pandemic and thinking about team building right now virtually, what would you say to them in terms of tips that you can think of about building trust, you know, with a distance? Yeah, and that's really hard, Carolyn, because, you know, we are, you know, social, social animals and we love to be around other people 
Um, we need to be around other people. And so it can be very isolating and it can be very hard to build the trust that you need for teamwork. Because, you know, team building things that we used to do in the military and the army were kind of like obstacle course and things you do together as a group. So I think it's time, it, right now in these times, we have to be more creative in um, bringing people in. And if you're a leader, and I define people as, you know, leaders are those who influence others, and that can be anyone, even if you're just a leader of yourself. Uh, leaders need to uh, reach out to those that are in their group or their team, or any members of the team. If you've got a, a team of you know, five, six, 10, 20, depending on the number, don't wait for them to contact you, contact them. You know, find uh, uh, opportunities to have a, uh, you know, ways to join, even if it is like on a Zoom chat or something like that, where you can have a, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, connection and a bond. And they're not only in a group, but one-on-one -on -one, and hopefully things where you can see people. And, uh, and if you can see some people that look, look like they're not doing too well, maybe don't call them out in the group, but afterwards contact them and say, hey, you're looking a little down. What's going on? So I think it's really important to do things like that, being creative. I know some folks take their yoga classes outside, you know, and, or other types of things where they, you know, keep the social distance, but um, and over, over uh, you know, several states and, and areas in, in larger areas, you can't necessarily do that. But you can reach out to others and just make sure that so they know that you care about them. Because, you know, as leaders and as, you know, teammates, we have to make sure that we care about each other. They, they stress that in the Army. You know, you have a battle buddy, the person to your left and to your right. Your most valuable asset are your team members. And so, you know, creative ways of reaching out to them, keeping them well informed. So I would say communication, uh, both, both ways, listen to them and reach out to them. Don't wait for them to call or, or to check on you. Uh, transparency, make sure, you know, if there's things that are going on in the organization, you know, communicate, have some periodic way of getting information out, you know, newsletters, you know, virtual newsletters or some other uh, creative way of keeping people informed so they don't get think the worst or feel like, hey, is something going on and I'm, I'm missing and I missed the memo type thing. Um, mm -hmm. And then empathy, you know, realize, hey, if there are folks that, you know, are struggling uh, that, you know, have, you know, kids at home and they're by themselves or other whatever situation that they're in, try to Try to put yourselves in their shoes to say what do you, what what might they need, and um, be there, and then offer assistance uh, to them if you can. Right, I think that humanity aspect is so important. And honestly, this concept of battle buddy, I'm going to start to think of my colleagues as my battle buddies going through this pandemic, as well as the world of work right now. I think that's a very useful concept, even outside of the military. I want to go ahead and take a question from the stream, which I think is a good follow up. Celeste wants to know, how do you navigate with people who are opposing views, values right now and during the pandemic? It's one thing to do this in person, but to do it virtually or over the phone, how do you do that? How do you address conflict right now? Yeah, and that's really a hard one. And one of the things that, that I learned early in my career is treating everyone with dignity and respect, not only my career, but that's how my family you know, taught us. If you can come from a point of, uh, you know, of a, a loving way of dealing with the other, uh, you can be, you can disagree. In fact, I have a lot of individuals that I disagree with their, with their philosophy on different things, but you still can treat them as, you know, the human being that they are. You know, my, my faith tradition, Roman Catholic, uh, Pope John Paul II used to say, every human being is unique, precious, and unrepeatable. And, you know, it made me pause to think, you know, we, we might think of someone else as opposing us or annoying to us, but they are unique, precious, and repeatable, unrepeatable, meaning they won't be here once they're gone from this earth to someone else. And so we have to remember that in the context that we may not agree with them, but they do have value and dignity as a person. And we can, uh, if we talk in a way or, you know, try to listen uh, to understand their point of view, uh, I think that will go a long way in trying to uh, hear people rather than just waiting to, you know, waiting for them to stop talking so you can get your point across, because that happens a lot, you know, even face-to-face, -face, phone, whatever way. Uh, but I think it's, and it's, it's harder because there's, there's so much to communication, there's expression uh, that you lose, and there's an anonymity that you get in social media. Like if you're phoning one-to-one, -one, you know who you're talking to, but if there's a large group, and, and that's what we see, unfortunately, a lot of cyber bullying and some of the comments that people can make anonymously, that they probably wouldn't say to someone if they were looking them in the face. 
Um, mm -hmm. But uh, you know, try to make sure that you know you can read into people's uh, discussion, and especially over the phone, if you hear something, ask them to clarify because they may be saying something with a joke, and you would know that by the expression on their face. But you can't you can't tell on the phone if someone says something. And you're like, okay, I heard you say this. Um, can you explain what you really mean by that? And that's a way that you can have uh, to minimize misperceptions um, during a conversation. Such great advice and something that I should take up. You take that as well with some of the meetings that I'm having virtually. Figuring out how to deal with people with opposing views is a big topic on LinkedIn. But another we're seeing a lot of people talk about is just career detours. So many people are having to take a step in their career. They just didn't think that they were going to at this point. I'm assuming that detours are something that you're familiar with from your time of service. What is your advice to them as they are trying to navigate the unknown and still feel like they are making steps forward with the plans that they had made pre-pandemic? Yeah, and that's a hard one. And, and, I, and I have uh, had quite a few detours uh, in my career. And I think it's, it's the attitude that you have uh, towards them. And, and, and some might say, well, it's easy for you to say, but you know, my situation is, and then you know, put, you know, fill in the blank because we all have unique situations. Some of us don't have the means that others do. And so it's, it's a lot harder for some individuals. And I, and I recognize that, acknowledge that. But during my career, there were times where, again, I'm a, you know, not proselytizing, but I'm a person of faith. And some of the detours that I thought were you know, career enders or something that was, you know, it's like, okay, this is, this is I'm going off you know, in some direction, ended up being some of the most rewarding uh, career options that I uh, that I had, and if I had, had if I had chosen myself, I probably would not have made that great of a choice because I was putting a lot of what I thought was needed in that rather than what was needed for the army and needed for the team. And uh, the the concept that I have is that there are always areas within the army that need good leaders. And if I if I consider if I'm considered a good leader, hopefully, um, maybe there's something that I can offer to that unit that I'm going to, uh, as opposed to the one that I thought that I should have gone to or would have gone to over here. So things worked out in that um, arena. And it even worked out with our kids because that's another thing. You know, my husband and I both Army, uh, we had two young children early on. And so we were always concerned about what impact that would have and what, what you know, jobs that would have for them, you know, our jobs would have on that. But again, it's attitude. I think if we, we approach it like an adventure, and so the kids approach it like an adventure. Um, were there some, you know, back and forth? Yes, there were. But I think in this environment, as individuals are looking at what's going to happen, try to stay positive, uh, stay well informed, well connected with those to, to make sure you know they know your desires. Is hey, I'm out here, I'm trying to do this, and then also, um, also to try to you know reinvent yourself or be prepared to reinvent yourself. Be agile and adaptable. If you see the handwriting on the wall, it may not have been what you wanted to do, but maybe. You know, if you see opportunities in another area, don't be fearful. Um, embrace it as an opportunity if that uh, comes your way. Well, I know I speak for everyone in this stream when I say, given how much you've achieved in your career, if you were able to navigate a few detours, it gives me a lot of solace that we'll be able to navigate these detours as well. I'm going to go ahead and say hello to some members in the stream who are just joining us. Nancy says, as a former military wife and mom of the U.S. Naval Academy graduate, I know your firsthand bravery and some of your struggles. Thank you for your service. Lakeisha says, my dad always told me, if you don't ask the answer, will always be no. So Nancy, Lakeisha, thank you for joining us on Business Unusual. Dr. West, I want to switch gears a little bit because on top of your amazing service, you also are a physician and right now are advising several healthcare companies in the space about how to navigate the pandemic. What are the biggest challenges that, that they are facing, particularly as a lot of states are going through reopenings right now? Well, I think it's the consistency and message. Um, I think there are some, you know, again, the, the healthcare companies specifically are, are really having a hard time of it, um, trying to keep that consistent message to their patients and their workforce. Um, you know, the whole concept of, you know, stopping a, what's called elective procedures during this time, some, you know, decisions were made to do that in order to preserve the PPE, the protective equipment, um, and also to, to decrease the burden on healthcare workers, or that's what the intent is. But you know, the so when people think of elective procedures, sometimes people think of that that's like cosmetic procedures. But you know, elective procedures can be a biopsy of a breast mass, or a colonoscopy to screen for colon cancer, or a visit to the dermatologist for a changing mole. Those can all be considered elective type of you know biopsy of a mole. 
can be elective unless it's a, a malignant melanoma that could be something that can you know really impact your life so i think it's concerning for them that they're going to have they have to curtail services to their population um, that have conditions that may you know care deferred might become an issue you know down the road so that's the first part the the concern for their patients and those that they take care of as well as their workforce and so they want to make sure that their workforce feels safe uh, coming back to work or being in an environment where they're taking care of patients so it's the safety of their workforce you know what's happening with their patients and that's and that's what i've seen at the forefront of their concerns not the bottom line of how is this impacting our you know our you know our uh, profits and losses and things even though they're a business and they you know that's something that they are concerned about they have to be that's not at the front of their minds when i'm when i hear them talking it's a genuine concern of what's happening with their patients and what's happening with their workforce and ensuring mm -hmm. that they stay safe Sure. And I think you saw the poll that we ran at the beginning of the show around another round of state closures. But what's your take on this? Are you seeing that another shutdown should be possible, given some of the concerns that mayors across the country have around testing and also overrun hospitals? Yeah, there, there may be. You know, again, I'm uh, you know, I, I will leave the specifics uh, to the to the, you know, the public health professionals. But I think the environment is such, you know, just from you know, the, uh, you know, looking at the environment, looking what we know now about the disease, that unless there is a, um, a discipline amongst our entire population to take the measures that we can, and until there's a, a suitable vaccine or some other countermeasure, what can we do? And that's the issue. You can, you can you lose the sense of helplessness if you know what can we do that works. We know that you know wearing a facial covering works. It's just it just does. There was a study I think, or in the news I think, uh, that there were two um, salon workers that had COVID that wore their masks and had in contact with like 130 something patrons, and they were about 15 minutes per patient average contact time. And you know if you're in a salon, you're arms length, so you're less than six feet. And no one came down with COVID, but their family members did because they weren't wearing masks at home. Now they, they didn't do this to say, okay, let, let me go to work with COVID, but that kind of was, you know, retroactively looking at that case study shows that wearing masks makes a difference. Uh, and so people can wear masks when they're outside or some facial coverings and, you know, take heed for the social distancing. Cause I'm, I think we're seeing some of the after effects when people don't do that and the hand washing, of course, wash your hands, hand sanitizers. And then again, you know, not touching your face or your eyes if you touch things. And then also the masks. Sometimes people, don't, you know, we wear the masks, but then I see people touching the center of them to take them off. It becomes like a chin and, cover. Right. And then, but, but if you touch your face, you touch the front of the mask that's been filtering, then you can contaminate if there happens to be, you know, virus, viral particles that are captured by the outside of the mask. So, taking them off carefully, then washing your hands afterwards. Um, just things like that, I think, if, if we aren't as a society willing to do that, and it's not just about us. A lot of people think, well, I'm healthy and young, it's not gonna bother me. But what about your colleagues? What about your neighbors? What about the, the, the person you know, next to you that might have a, you know, uh, just completed a round of chemotherapy for cancer? What about the young infant who's, is, who's too young to have their childhood vaccines or has a, a nascent immune system that's not able to fight off as, as well as someone else. So I think there has to be more of a social responsibility in my, in my mind, or we will be, we will have recrudescence of this for the foreseeable future until we can, we come up with a vaccine or countermeasure. Um, so I think we can limit it by all doing our part. Right. That community aspect is really important. Dr. West, thank you so much for your insights, not just from your time of service, but also as a healthcare professional. Before I let you go, for the members on the stream right now who may be working remotely or in the office and just don't see a lot of people who look like them, this is an experience that you had throughout your career. What is your advice for them tackling adversity during this challenging time? Well, what I would say is, uh, you know, if you don't, and again, I didn't see a lot of people that look like me, if you don't see people that look like you, then talk to people who are doing what you want to do that don't look like you. Um, start off with the, with mentors that uh, and you know be aggressive in a in a positive way. You know, be obnoxious if you have to to say, hey, I'm interested in doing X, Y, and Z as a job, and I see that you're doing it. How did you get to where you are? How did you know? What are some recommendations you have? 
Um, and so, you know, it's not ideal, but people will be, you'd be surprised. Most of my mentors were white males just because that's what was ahead of me in the army. And that's just the way that the army's configured. And so, but I had a lot of great mentors that really made a difference in my life and in my career path. So don't, don't be hesitant to reach out to those who don't look like you. Uh, because they you be, they would will surprise you if you ask someone usually they're flattered that you want them to give you advice and uh, and they'll they'll help you uh, but also find out if there's any networks if there are any areas uh, in you know in your in your neighborhood or go online to see if in that job description of what you're interested in if there are any uh, individuals that look like you and be bold reach out to them you'd be surprised they're like well, I can never email or talk to them. You'd be so surprised that there are people that are very, very accessible and would be willing to help you if you if you can. So be bold. Again, if you don't ask, worst I can do is say no, right? They're not going to come after you if you, you know, don't just say can't do it. So that's what I would say. And well, keep, and I keep going. And I can speak from personal experience in that I was nervous reaching out to you to come on the show and was thrilled that you said yes. So, Dr. Nadia West, thank you so much for your insights and for your time of service. We really appreciate you joining us on Business Unusual. Absolutely, Carolyn. It was my honor. And you stay safe and healthy, okay? You as well. Thanks. That was Dr. Nadia West talking to us about her time of service and just so many great lessons that we can all take with us into the office or remotely as we work through this pandemic. This is Business Unusual, a live show where we're talking about the changing nature of work. I'm going to go ahead and bring up the results of the poll that we had at the beginning of the show, which is, do you think that another shutdown is possible for your state? 59% vast majority of you said yes, you think that this is possible. That's Judy, Lewis, Susanna, Clara, Vaughn, Jacqueline from Kentucky, Holly, Terry, Ann, Alexandra, Deborah, Maria, all voting yes. A couple no's from Shanta, Karen, Clara, Zena, and some depends from Henry. So we want to thank you all for participating in the poll that we had for you today. As I said, this is a daily live show, so be sure to come back tomorrow at 12 Eastern to join my colleague Susie Jackson for a conversation with Elizabeth White. She's the author of 55, Unemployed and Faking Normal, Your Guide to a Better Life. They'll be talking about how older professionals can navigate their careers during the pandemic. I'm Caroline Fairchild. Thank you so much for joining us.